welcome to the Global Peace Film Festival Lives Online Conversation 2021 Festival Edition. Please join me, Kelly Devine, the Artistic Director, and Nina Strike, the Executive Director, in conversation with Nadia Tass and Joan Borston, the filmmakers behind the film Oleg, which you can watch as a part of this year's film festival. Our in-person screenings begin at the Winter Park Library starting September 21st through September 26th. The virtual streaming portion of the festival begins September 27th and runs through October 3rd. All the information regarding scheduling, ticketing, and other events can be found at peacefilmfest.org. And now let's welcome Nadia and Joan. Hello. Hello. It's, Hello. Hi, it's delightful to have you with us. And I will start with Nadia, the, uh, the director of the film, and ask you about, uh, to tell us about the film and then follow up with Joan to tell, to tell us about your role. You're the producer, but tell us about your role, which goes much deeper. So Nadia? It's a, an individual story. It's about one man who lived an extraordinary life in the USSR over three and a half decades. He was the star, the major star of the USSR cinema. And uh, against all odds, he needed to escape because he was persecuted, he was tortured and... Uh, if he hadn't have chosen to leave to escape, it is possible that he would have either ended up in the gulag or uh, they would have killed him. So this is a, a story about a man's pursuit for freedom, freedom to choose the life that he wanted to live and to live in a society where things were more equal and more just. And herein lies the irony because According to the USSR dictum, of course, it was supposedly meant that people were equal. But in actual fact, what we discover through this man's life, through examining this man's life, that that wasn't the case. And Oleg Vidov found his freedom once he escaped to the West. And he found a sense of equality in the society that he went to live in. So we do look at this man's amazing personal story, but it's set against the political system and the history of USSR cinema over that period. So I, I'm thrilled that it's a, a film that can really shed some sort of light for migrants of today. And it, it looks at, you know, is it worth taking the risk? to actually go to another place, to change one's life. And uh, certainly in Oleg Vidov's case, this was incredibly necessary and advantageous. Joan? Here I am. So tell us about your role with the film and your relationship. So I, I am the producer. Um, but I'm also the widow. Um, my grandparents escaped from the Soviet Union, well, from Russia in 1905 and never went back. And um, in all the years that I was a journalist, although I was many times asked to take an assignment behind the Iron Curtain, I didn't go. Um, and then a fortune teller in New Delhi who was Fili Federico Fellini's fortune teller um, after he explained to me his relationship with this Italian fantastic director, he took my hand and he said, you're gonna marry a man from a strange country. So that was about four years before I met Oleg and I went to a lot of strange countries and I kept thinking, is this the one? <laughs> and, um, and then I, um, there I was in Italy and I had um, changed, I was changing apartments. So I was staying with my friends, Richard Harrison and his wife, Francesca, and they get a call um, from a friend of a friend who says um, a um, Soviet actor needs to have a place to stay. He's coming to Rome to defect. Can he stay with you? And they said, of course. So I thought, hmm, what's that about? There are only two bedrooms. 
and Richard and Francesca are in one and I'm in the other. They said, oh, he'll be on the couch. Um, and uh, so I had to do a sweep through the Middle East. And when I came back, um, Oleg was there. Um, he'd already been to the embassy. He'd already been granted political asylum, but they told him he had two months before the papers would be ready. And um, he kept following me around the house, trying to tell me in English that was missing the future tense and the past tense, um, <laughs> why he had left and about his mother and his father and his aunt and his fans. And it was the same story kind of repeatedly. It got, as his English got better, it got a little shorter. Um, and um, uh, what can I tell you? I mean, I wasn't looking for a boyfriend, but anyway, it happened. And uh, <laughs> we knew he was a Soviet actor and the embassy felt that he was important. But one day we were walking um, through the streets of Rome and someone yelled out, oh look, oh look, Vidov, are you, is that you? because he walked around Rome with a baseball cap pulled down over his eyes so the KGB wouldn't notice him. And uh, it was uh, Albert Johnson, who was the um, programming director, I think, at the San Francisco Festival at that time. And he used to go to the Moscow Film Festival. So he said to me, do you know who this man is? And I said, well, he's a Soviet actor. And he said, no, my dear, he's the Robert Redford of Russia. And I thought, oh my God, what am I into here? <laughs> but um, anyway, that was... Um, 1985, he went, he went to the United States. He got a huge reception and headlines, Soviet Rob Redford goes west. Um, and I joined him about a month later. Um, and he really had to reinvent himself because in 1985, it was still the Cold War. And for American screenwriters, a Russian part or a Soviet part meant that you were either KGB or you were a gangster or you were a thug. Those were the choices and somehow Oleg didn't look like any of those parts. Um, and, but he was, you know, he continued to try and finally Walter Hill gave him a, a big break in Red Heat. It wasn't the biggest part, but the part he had auditioned for was a Georgian criminal and Walter after four attempts said, I just can't make the camera think you're bad. And that was the start of, um, of Oleg's career in um, Hollywood. Um, but at some point he decided he had to do something bigger than just be in films in the few that he could qualify for. And um, uh, he went to Russia uh, in late 1991, just before the end of the Soviet Union. And he came back and said, we're going to distribute this library of Soviet animation. And I said, to who, <laughs> what are you talking about? And um, as you'll see in the movie, it was, he was very successful and he felt that um, he was helping to change the Cold War perceptions of Russians. And I think he did. I'm really hopeful that after people see this, this inspiring portrait of, of Oleg's life, that, that people explore further and seek out those uh, Russian animations because they're, they're just beautiful. Um, but Joan, um, uh, this is as much your story, at least in the, the latter part of Oleg's life. So what was it, you know, what was it like for you to, uh, um, be so vulnerable, candid, and open with your own life? You know, um, my life with Oleg was about huge projects that he handed me to administer, whether I thought I could do them or not. One was the animation. There were two other big ones. And then now he's writing his autobiography. He's been writing it for three years. He passes unexpectedly and he leaves me instructions on how to finish it. So basically I went to bed. And then I think he passed in May. And in, in December, I got out of bed and I said, oh my God, he left me something I was supposed to do. So the idea was he gave me a list of six dozen people to interview to fill in like parts of chapters that he hadn't finished. So um, of course, everybody in the film industry here said, you have to film the interviews because it's probably a documentary. He's had an extraordinary life. So I started traveling around the world interviewing these people who, um, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating. And I understood that um, it was important to flesh out the story, but it was very meaningful to me. And trust me, Oleg was a very honest person, but it was very meaningful for me to be able to confirm through these people that the story that he told all of us for years was the story. There were, it, whatever small differences there were, it had to do with memory and 
Um, this may be a different perception, but I would say that probably 95% of the book was accurate. Well, and Nadia, what was, uh, how did you come to be involved in this, in the telling of Joan and Oleg's larger than life uh, journey? Oh, um, look, I, I knew Oleg. Uh, Joan and I had, you know, had a friendship and she introduced me to Oleg. This is, you know, many years ago. And uh, there were times when we would uh, have a coffee, the three of us, and, and lunches and so on. And I always found him so exciting to be with, uh, to understand the life that he led. I also have uh, Russian heritage in my background. And so there was a lot to talk about. As he used to say to Joan, I, I had an old Russian soul that I was carrying with me. He identified that. So there was a synergy there. The thing that fascinated me enormously and that I learned through this incredible story was that once you leave the country of birth or the country that you need to escape from, then what happens? You achieve your physical freedom. And that is, you know, a lot of the migrants and the refugees that we witness today, we see them arriving at their new land. What happens beyond that point? How much of their real life do they leave behind? With Oleg, what I discovered was he actually, yes, he found his freedom, but he, he left his soul behind. He never stopped being the Russian man that he was. He was a Russian man physically living in the West. And when he was asked to do uh, certain parts in Hollywood, and Hollywood at that stage when he was there, was, uh, was continually looking at Russians from a KGB perspective or, uh, you know, uh, a Russian sort of brute uh, character. And so he was, he, he was a man who was incredibly cultured and understood his Russianness and the Russian culture that he came from. And uh, the uh, parts that he was offered were not of the Russian image that he came with. And this was an amazing thing for me because I felt that, yes, he was living in the West, but no, he was, his soul was still living in Russia. And he was offended by the fact that people didn't know that Russia had such a, an extraordinary culture uh, in, in all the arts. And um, uh, so, it, you know, it just made me think how many of these people actually are not only physically living in the, their new countries, but um, totally in that space. And I admire so much that Oleg took it upon himself to do something about that, about that pers uh, perspective of Russian culture and take out the rights with Joan uh, to the animation series, restore them beautifully, revoice them with the major stars, with the top stars from Hollywood, and then send this new image of his home country into the West, into the world, so that people understood about the music, the theatre, the cinema that, uh, that Russia had. So that was, uh, I mean, this was a major point that I certainly learned through this because I'd heard about all these stories, certainly from my own family, because they had all also moved from uh, one place to another and so on. And I also am a migrant. I'm a migrant to Australia from Europe. And uh, it's, yeah, and it made sense. I was able to connect the dots not only for Oleg, but as a result of his life to connect the dots for many other refugees that I come across, migrants and for myself. That's a, that is a beautiful way to, to look at this film, Nadia. And uh, um, thank you for, for giving me that lens of, of extending this to 
other people's immigrant experience. But turning to Joan from what Nadia has just said, Joan, what was, you know, did you feel uh, a, that weight of responsibility to help Oleg um, tell his story? And, and what did you learn along the way through this process? You know, I mean, I felt that his story, even if, if, even if he wasn't my husband, his story was important. And it had all kinds of interesting twists and turns that I thought um, should be on the screen and should be shared with other people. Um, but as, as Nadia said, one of the things that I learned during production, because there were a lot of people working on the film who weren't born in this country, who, and the, the, the line that they would react to was when he said, I guess at the end, he said that um, happiness belongs to the risk takers. And they all identified with that. I, I found that really interesting. No, it's, um, it's true. There, uh, you know, Oleg's, uh, Oleg's life is um, uh, also one of embracing life. You know, he, he did not let uh, um, obstacles stand in his way of, of, of grabbing the gusto of life. And I, I think the, the film really, the film conveys, I wish I had met him because it conveys, uh, as I had said earlier, very much that, that kind of larger than life personality. You know, as, as much as the Soviet Union tried to um, punish him for leaving because defecting, defecting was like the worst crime possible, um, he had this huge fan base in, in, in the whole Soviet Union from the Baltics to Siberia and from the Arctic to the Southern Republics. And um, they didn't buy into it. And even, I mean, they would cut his name out of the titles of a film but he starred in the film. How were you gonna actually think it wasn't him? So um, finally, I think it was mm, just about towards the end of Paris Troika, about 1989, they put his name back on the films. Um, and then different journalists started to interview him. And um, you know, it progressed and it progressed along the ways, which you'll see in the film. And then in the very end, with the approval of the state, because it was the largest television station in Russia, owned by the state, they gave him a primetime 70th birthday party. And that was just for him, you know, he said, don't tell me I can't go, I have to go. <laughs> got it, got it. Um, and um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to ask both of you, and, and Joan, I'll start with you, is, you know, one of the things we try to do with this film festival is connect with uh, younger audiences. We have a lot of associations with colleges, high schools. And um, what would you say to the young people listening uh, about the importance of this story for them today? It's a very interesting time to be watching this film, in my opinion. Um, but I think that you, um, I, I think it, it, it teaches the values of freedom, the values of courage, the values of speaking up. Oleg was not a political person, but by defecting, he told a lot of people when they figured out where he was, you know, that he'd had to leave the country of the, you know, of the shining future. Um, and uh, I think to a lot of Soviets, who some of whom followed him, not him specifically, but left, um, I think that was an important story. And as you know, um, after 70 years, the Soviet Union which we were all terrified of, just died one night. It was, as a, as a journalist, I was often witness to history, but that was just something to see the flag come down from the flagpole of the Kremlin and never go back up again. Yeah, it was a remarkable, it, it, it was a remarkable anticlimactic end to, to what had been this, this grand worldwide drama. I mean, um, I remember, and maybe you guys do too, and um, young people watching this, let me tell you that in elementary school, we were taught to hide how to hide under the desk in case the Soviets nuked us. And all of a sudden, it's over. It was, yes, it was a remarkable turn of events indeed. And, um, and Nadia, you have, have already alluded to this, the, the connection between Oleg's story as, uh, as someone who had to flee his country um, but if you could just underline that kind of connection um, 
for young people who might be watching this film today? Well, you know, the, uh, the concept or the, uh, the, po the political system of communism is, is a very interesting one, certainly for people who haven't lived in that world. But the perceptions that we have from the West of what this would be like or was like uh, are not necessarily accurate. And some of them can be idealized. And certainly I've had all sorts of people in my world, in my family, extended family, that you know have idolized that concept. And then to, um, to actually be working with this story and find some of the atrocities that were being um, that were being you know uh, done to people during that time it kind of throws a different light not that there is any political system that's perfect um, looking at the systems it's you know everything is sort of something short of perfection but uh, when we look at Oleg's story and then we examine what was being done to him and it was so it's so unjust and those those atrocities actually haven't stopped even with after perestroika there those atrocities they've changed in nature perhaps but they're equally as violent and vile and against humanity and so i think it's you know it really makes me think well why are we being so violent why are we being so atrocious is power so uh so important to these systems and to these people who run these systems that uh that they have no qualms about being so incredibly violent to their own citizens um i know that i'm speaking in broad terms here but you know it really made me look at the political systems that we human beings uh, learn or live under. When Oleg came to the West and he brought with him his own humanity, uh, he didn't leave his humanity behind. And he was faced with Russians coming into the West, other people defecting and suddenly arriving in Los Angeles and not knowing you know what to do how to set themselves up and so what we find in his story is that his door was always open and Joan can attest to the fact that there were so many people who came through irrespective of time or day his he, they would take the Russians in and help them set up in this new land and I just find that sort of humanity worth noting because at the end of the day, we're all, hu well, we are all human and at different times, we all need the helping hand that's gonna help, that's gonna make our lives a little bit easier. And then to repeat that in the future for somebody else. Uh, so Joan can attest to the fact that Russians throughout, throughout Oleg's life, Russians were helped constantly because he brought with him that awareness of, of torture and the need to support each other. I, I think that there's one other thing that um, I would like young people watching this film to think about, which is that um, so far we still have rule of law, but they didn't. And um, they lived in a system where even if the law was on your side, someone in the government could literally pick up the telephone, call the judge and say, this is how you're going to rule. So at the beginning of perestroika and in the first years of Yeltsin, um, the Soviet Union was committed to, for the courts to begin operating on rule, according to rule of law. That never happened. And it was one of, I think it still is one of the great tragedies of, of Russia. Um, but we wanna really guard rule of law here because it's one of the very important things that we have. And you can see it very clearly in Russia's and Oleg's experience in the courtroom in Russia, what it means when you know you're right and the judge says, I got a telephone call. That is 
uh, an important, a very, very important point to bring up. Thank you, Joan. And and it 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 dovetails in a way um, into what I wanted to start to talk about, which is why I selected this film for a, a festival whose mission is about creating a more just and peaceful world. Um, our conception of peace is not just simply the absence of war or some kind of unattainable perfection. It's about our humanity, how we deal with our inevitable conflicts, but how we find models and frameworks that maintain our respect for one another, our humanity, our dignity in dealing with one another. And I, um, when I watched Oleg's story, I saw those qualities shining through. And so I would just like to, you know, give you that chance to, to talk about how you see his life in, in terms of creating that more peaceful world. Nadia? Oh, you want to? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oleg, yeah. yeah. Mm, let me think about that. Oleg, um, he was just, I don't know. He, he was, he, he loved the United States because he said, nobody bothered you. <laughs> and um, I remember that um, there, there's a book written by uh, Luba Brezhneva, who was the niece of, uh, of Leonid Brezhnev. And she said that um, the most successful, one of the most successful industries in the Soviet Union was snitching. <laughs> everybody snitched on everybody else. Um, and here he said, you know, people were too busy. They didn't really care. They weren't going to do that just because you had a slightly better apartment and they wanted it. They wouldn't go, you know, to the, uh, the FBI or the CIA and say, oh, you know, he's telling jokes about the president. And if they did, it wouldn't get them anywhere. So um, I, he, and he, he talked to that. He talked to everybody about that all the time. And, and Nadia, you wanted to also speak to that issue? Well, I mean, you know, his, it's his life that's really testament to that. He never moved outside of his, the core of who he was, which was a decent human being, someone who cared about others and someone who made sure that if he could do something to make other people's lives better, he would do it. And it's, I think this is a major lesson for all of us. Um, I th and I think that lesson comes from uh, when he was very young. He was brought up by his mother, who was a very uh, intelligent, learned woman and who, who was a teacher, but also his aunt, who was like a lay philosopher. She was a nurse, but she was, a, she was an incredible brain, a humanitarian. And so he took from her all these lessons about who he was as a, as a human being. And he never actually succumbed to the atrocities and to become part of the, uh, the world, the, the larger world that he was exposed to as an adult in the USSR, where there was so much conflict and uh, espionage and um, comparison with, you know, one house to another. I mean, there was there were four and five families living in one tiny small space. It's inevitable that there are going to be comparisons about, oh, you have the better, you know, better position or whatever. But he never succumbed to that. And I find it interesting that he, the teachings that he was exposed to from his aunt in particular, Aunt Newta just followed him and he lived by them. And irrespective of ethnicity of people that he came across throughout his life, people were people. And it was, and that is a huge lesson, not only for me, you know, I have a Slavic background, I'm, you know, uh, it's Macedonian, Russian and Northern Greek and, and all of these, but it's really, for everybody. And here in Australia, we have refugees who are constantly coming into our country. We witness that, you know, suddenly next door, there's somebody else who's come in. They don't speak English. So how do we treat them? And here is a man who was a total hu human throughout his life. And I admire that. 
Uh, well said. I think people who watch this film will also admire Oleg. And, and Nina, I know you had a couple of other questions. Well, I just, in wrapping up, I just wanted to, uh, to ask you both um, to tell us how our audiences can support this film and also the, and, and your work and also what's next for both of you. Um, well, <laughs> um, they can support the film by um, watching it on your network. Um, I guess it will all, I, I don't know how many more festivals we have that where they're showing the films virtually, but um, if you hear about us, come and join the festival. And um, uh, I, I just hope that we will, we're beginning now to look for distributors. We're beginning to win prizes and therefore distributors are actually coming to us. And hopefully it will be on one of the ones that's easily accessible. Um, and I have to say one of the benefits of the pandemic to me is that um, my cousins in Minneapolis learned to like subtitles. They would never before <laughs> have gone to films that had subtitles in them. And now they call me and they say, oh, did you see that Danish film? And I said, you mean the one with the subtitles? Well, yeah. <laughs> so um, I really hope that, um, you know, everybody comes to see the film, even though there are subtitles in it. I also want to say that we were very lucky in the people who work with us. And um, as it turned out, the narrator, who, Brian Cox, who I think a lot of people know from Succession, it turns out that the reason he even did, he became the narrator is that um, he spent two years teaching acting in the Soviet Union. Then he wrote a book about it. Then he got the BBC to do a documentary called Brian Cox's Russia. And his daughter went to St. Petersburg University. So not only did he pronounce everything perfectly, but he knew he could speak with authority because he knew it was true. Wonderful, that, that was a wonderful bit of background uh, information. Thank you, Joan. Yes. <laughs> I, think, um, I think the, you know, the way people can really, uh, you know, once people have a look at this film and they get what they need from it, each person will get something different. Uh, it would be fabulous to actually, you know, reach out through social media and comment and talk about you know, either on a larger scale about, you know, what is contained in the film or their personal experience with the film. I think through social media we can reach out and, and speak with people all over the world. So, uh, you know, uh, to do that and... Um, uh, and share their experiences. I think sharing is a really good way of connecting human beings. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, Russian stories are always are always enigmatic for me, probably because I do have a Russian background as well. But um, you know, there are so many lessons to be learned from this. Uh, not that it, you know, not that I I made the film for for it to be a teaching experience but I think just by witnessing his story uh, it became it becomes such an incredible lesson in so many different ways you know Russian cinema we trace Russian cinema over the decades of uh, Oleg's life there and uh, so some of the films that he was in and some of the films that came out of the USSR are incredibly interesting and say so much about that society. So, yeah, I think it's a really good thing for uh, people to see it and to uh, share. And I'm turning the book into the publisher next week. Wonderful. Wonderful. Very good. Yes, well, thank you both so much. And Nadia, um, thank you for mentioning sharing because uh, we do live by the motto that sharing is caring here. So thank you for, for reminding us of that. And thank you, Joan, for, for joining us as well. It's been fascinating uh, uh, talking to you and, and hearing these stories. Um, and we really appreciate your generosity in sharing this incredible story with our audiences. And um, thank you all who have uh, listened to this particular interview. If you wish to learn more, uh, please check out olegvidovfilm.com 
And I'm sure you'll be able to find out uh, which social media channels that you can uh, connect uh, and, and share your experiences. And again, please check out peacefilmfest.org so that you can find out all the information about how to see Oleg as part of our 2021 festival. And we will see you at the next Glow. Thank you.